The engines failed over the sea late at night in stormy weather. What happened? The Channel Islands are a group of islands off the south of the English Channel, to the south of the bottom of England, to the northwest of France. Guernsey and Jersey make up the largest of the islands, Guernsey being at the top, Jersey being below. Guernsey is a home base for search and rescue aircraft. This particular one was registered as Gough Charlie India Alpha Sierra. It was a Pilatus B&2B Islander and was operated in a search and rescue operator's role, SARops for short. The B&2B Islander is equipped with two piston engines. This particular one, along with a plethora of search equipment, it had two main fuel tanks and two tip fuel tanks with switches in the cockpit to select fuel supply to the engines from either the main fuel tanks or the tip tanks. The aircraft was run by a voluntary organisation on the Channel Islands, run by a board of trustees. Funding for operations were received from private donations and Channel Island governments. As such, the aircraft flights were classed as private. The aircraft was routinely flown by a crew consisting of a pilot in the front left-hand seat, an observer in the front right-hand seat, a search director seated at the workstation behind the pilot, and two further observers seated behind the search director's workstation. But who was to know, days after this training flight, they would be swallowed by the devil's hole. Approximately 18.30 hours on the 3rd of November 2013, the operator's duty pilot received a request that the aircraft should be dispatched and carry out a search. The volunteer crew members were alerted and made their way to the aircraft. Weather conditions in the Channel Islands were poor, with southerly winds gusting up to 41 knots, that's 76 kilometres per hour. Turbulence, rain, cloud below 1,000 feet above aerodrome level, and visibility of only 3 to 6 kilometres. On arrival to the aircraft's hangar, the crew was established containing a pilot, a search director and three observers. They donned immersion suits and life jackets and prepared for the flight. The search director obtained details of the search request, which was a search for two fishermen near a group of rocks in the English Channel, approximately five nautical miles northeast of the northeastern corner of Jersey. Some evidence suggested that the men were in a small dinghy. Other information was that they were in the water. The men were reported to be alive and communicating by mobile telephone. All emergency services in the area sprang to action. After the aircraft was pulled out of the hangar, one crew member did the walk around and pre-flight inspection. The walk around is a procedure to check that there are no defects on the aircraft, such as blocked sensors, damaged wing services, etc. Also, physical oil quantities are checked, including, most importantly, the fuel quantities, which are also checked and confirmed by dipping the fuel tanks with a calibrated fuel measuring device. It was the organisation's custom, after all, to ensure that the aircraft was ready for flight at all times. The technical log showed that the aircraft was serviceable with no deferred defects and the wing tanks contained 55 US gallons each side and the tip tanks 18 US gallons each side. It was reported that the search director asked the pilot whether he was content to fly in the prevailing conditions. The pilot stated that he was willing to fly. The crew boarded the aircraft. 
the observer in the front right hand seat had recently obtained a private pilot's license. This influenced his decision for him to be placed next to the pilot. It was reported that the pilot carried out a fairly rapid start to the engine checklists. Although the normal pre-departure sequence was interrupted while a problem with the switch selections affecting the functioning of the search equipment in the aircraft's cabin was resolved. The pilot obtained clearance from ATC to taxi, enter the runway and take off when ready. which way the aircraft took off this night, it would face the full brunt of a crosswind. As it was November now, it was dark. The wind reported by air traffic control for the takeoff was 180 at 28 knots. The minimum demonstrated crosswind for this aircraft, the Islander, was 30 knots. Two knots in the difference. The stall speed published by the flight manual for the aircraft at the operating weight and with flaps up was 50 knots. The aircraft was plainly now operating almost within its demonstrated crosswind limit for this takeoff. The crew must have been uneasy about this departure. But there was also reported gusts of up to 41 knots, way past the crosswind limit for this takeoff in this aircraft. Takeoff was recorded as unremarkable. Due to the strong crosswinds, the pilots corrected for drift and established a climb towards an altitude of around 900 feet. They continued over the coast, out to sea, to search for the missing fishermen. Recovered radar recordings reported that at 19.0300 hours, the aircraft was located just 6.3 nautical miles from Jersey Airport at approximately 500 feet above mean sea level, when it began a right-hand turn towards Jersey, climbing to approximately 1,100 feet. At 19.0500 hours, when it was 1.2 miles from the coast, the altitude began to reduce until 19.0700 hours, when the final radar return recorded the aircraft at a position approximately 200 feet from the ground. We lost the left engine! We're losing power on the right! We lost the power! Brace 10. Brace the impact. So why and how did both engines fail, one after the other, late at night in stormy weather? Moreover, what was the fate of the crew members on the aircraft? And also, what was the fate of the fishermen left marooned in the sea? We will now examine the train of circumstances leading up to this accident, including the fate of all involved. 
The nose of the aircraft had struck the base of a tree that marked the boundary of a sloping field. The damage was consistent with the nose striking the tree at relatively low speed. The left main gear leg had been distorted aft at its mounting in the wing. The propeller blades on the left engine showed signs of having been rotating while striking the ground. There were ground marks covering 140 metres from the bow of the hill down to where the aircraft had come to rest, which were made by the landing gear. And approximately 20 metres from the aircraft there was a wider ground mark followed by a series of regularly spaced dash marks. The left main gear had been distorted rearward and made the large ground mark and the left propeller blades which were rotating caused the slash marks. It's estimated from the slash marks that the rotational speed of the left engine was well below 1000 rpm. Fuel samples were taken. Both main fuel tanks were almost full when the aircraft landed. Both tip tanks were empty. The fuel pipes closest to the engines were removed and only very small samples of fuel were recovered, consistent with both engines being starved of fuel. The fuel tank selector switches in the cockpit were both found to be in the tip tank position. By this you can deduce that the tip tanks were selected for the flight with little fuel remaining and caused the engines to stop mid-flight, whilst there was plenty of fuel remaining in the main fuel tanks. You might ask yourself why didn't the pilot simply have the clarity to switch from the tip tanks to the main tanks containing all the fuel. Yes, but while we're comfortably sitting in our armchairs, there's a lot of clarity in hindsight. So why was it not so clear on the night of the flight? You may have been guessing, judging by the damage to the airframe, did the crew survive the Devil's Hole crash? If you guessed yes, fortunately you were quite correct. The entire crew survived without any reported injuries after they alerted a nearby dwelling where emergency services arrived. As you can see above, the position time at 1903, the pilot executed a right-hand turn to the south towards Jersey Airport. This was the moment the right-hand engine RPM began surging. The pilot also executed an immediate climb before both engines had failed. This instant action allowed for extra altitude, allowing the pilot to glide to the coast, avoiding a sea ditching, which typically has a low probability of survival. Judging by the flight path shown here, the pilot just barely made the coast. Also, I find it remarkable that the pilot managed to successfully execute a forced glide approach in the dark with low forward visibility whilst avoiding ground obstacles just before and during the ground roll. Is it something to do with a lifetime of over 25,000 hours of flying experience or a fluke? We may never know. Either way, it is not discussed in the report, as pilots do not get to influence the narrative of such an investigation. Cockpit ergonomics is a science relating to the position and layout of instruments to make flying an aircraft safer and more logical for the pilot to operate. For example, it would be counterproductive for a switch to light up red to indicate on and green to indicate off. The inverse would be more understandable as green means go and red means stop, or warning. As with illuminated system selections, it would be logical to have the light on to indicate that that system is active, and the light off to indicate that that system is not active. The important role that ergonomics has to play in aviation safety is that of minimising human error induced by poorly designed equipment or by stressful working environments. Of course, ergonomics can also enhance aviation safety by maximising human performance under normal and abnormal conditions. In recent decades, cockpit layouts and the logic within have improved immensely, adding to the operational safety of aircraft. However, this aircraft was designed back in 1982. As stated before, this aircraft had two main fuel tanks and two tip tanks, with switches in the cockpit to select the fuel supply to the engines from either the main or the tip tanks. There are two further switches associated with the fuel system. These served two purposes, depending on which tanks were selected to feed the engines. With the main tank selected, it disabled the lights, which indicated tank selection. With the tip tank selected, it dimmed the lights, which showed that the tip tanks were in use. 
It was also noted that the fuel selectors for the engines and the main fuel tanks were prominent, and the main fuel tank quantity gauges were conveniently sighted above the top of the centre windscreen pillar. However, the tip main tank switches were much smaller and located away from the main fuel selectors, remote from the tip tank quantity gauges which were themselves on the right hand side passenger service unit above the right hand cockpit window. It is also noted in the report that the dimming function of the tip tank indicators further complicated the presentation of fuel supply information to the pilot. During the flight, due to the bumpy weather and poor visibility, all the pilot's attention was fixated to flying the aircraft. When the right-hand engine had stopped, the pilot carried out shutdown checks feathering the propeller as he did so. The aircraft carried on tracking towards Jersey Airport, descending towards the north side of the island. Moments later, of course, the left-hand engine's RPM began to fluctuate briefly before it also stopped. The pilot later recalled being fairly certain that he was trying to change the tanks, but acknowledged that he could not recall the events with certainty. You could only imagine that seeing as the aircraft was close to the surface already and the engines had failed that the stress levels were indeed quite high. The layout and the logic of the fuel system were a contributory factor, but not the sole contribution to the accident. The big question is, why did the tip tanks run out of fuel so quickly? And was the aircraft doomed before they even started the engines? Confirmation bias is a tendency to search for, interpret, favour and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values. People display this bias when they select information that supports their views, ignoring contrary information, or when they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing attitudes. The accident aircraft was routinely kept ready for flight at all times. When the crew returned from a flight, the aircraft was always filled full of fuel, ready for the next flight. If the aircraft was left outside the hangar, it was thought to be needing fuel. If the aircraft was inside the hangar, it was always ready for flight and full of fuel. In this case, the aircraft was inside the hangar, including paperwork supporting the fact that the aircraft was filled of fuel the day before the flight. Due to the urgency and the plight of the fishermen that night, it was assumed that the aircraft was full of fuel on both the main and the tip tanks. After all, it was always full of fuel. So there was no reason to doubt that I wasn't full of fuel this time. This is confirmation bias. So what is exactly dipping the fuel tanks? The simplest and most effective way to measure how much fuel there is in an aircraft's fuel tank is to physically check it. This is a dipstick. It's a calibrated dipstick and dipped into the tank and you'll see the wet mark indicating how much fuel there is in that side of the tank. In light aircraft, it is well known that fuel gauges can be unreliable. If I know the aircraft burns six gallons an hour and I have 12 gallons of total fuel, six gallons aside, I now know I have two hours of total flying time before I need to refuel. On the accident flight, one crew member carried out pre-flight inspections, although he did not check the fuel quantities. When interviewed, he recalled having reported to the pilot that he had not physically checked the fuel. It was asserted during the investigation that the tip tanks were not full of fuel before the flight, even though the paperwork may have suggested otherwise. Furthermore, the main tanks were always left selected. In this case, it is not determined by whom or when the tip tanks were actually selected for the night of the accident flight. Air accident investigation is not designed to assert blame. It is simply designed to find out what went wrong and how it can be fixed in the future. There can be no doubt, however, about the bravery of the accident crew with regards to their mission to find the stricken fishermen, and in, in such unfavourable conditions. If you were called upon to find the fishermen in such weather conditions, would you refuse to take off or just go? This, along with the knowledge of the limited survival time of hypothermia, could you face your community knowing full well that it would have been up to you to find them for rescue? There were already three accidents eerily similar to this one. 1981 Guernsey, 1982 Wiltshire, 2002 Antigua. 
All reports included the ergonomics of the fuel system were potentially to blame as well. All of the accidents included the exact same aircraft model and type. So we must leave with the assertion that the brave will always lie in harm's way to save others.